Welcome to Mazandercast, a Persian podcast about myth, magic, and mustachayar. I'm your co-host, Seth. And I'm your co-host, Sarah. We're glad you're here with us for another episode. So get your tea. Or your coffee. Maybe some snacks while you're at it. And let the adventure begin. It's time, <laughs> Seth. So excited. We have been talking for a long time about you going to Iran one day. And uh, I know that Iran is not really a place that a lot of people think about going to travel. Not on your typical top 10 uh, tourist countries, no. I want to go to the Caribbean. I want to go to Venice. And I want to go to Tehran. I want to go to France. <laughs> wah, wah. Wow, you going to go there, huh? All right, get your mind out of France. So yeah, we've talked about going to Iran one day, but I want to know what are some of the things that you want to know before going, and what are some of the things you want to do once you actually get to Iran? Well, uh, you've told me about a lot of different things that uh, there are to do in Iran, from you know rooftop parties to nature trails to uh, going out into the country and going to see all these amazing landmarks and natural monuments and all that. Um, but I guess as far as what I'd be interested in knowing that I don't know already is what's the process for getting there? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the flights like? Uh, what kind of, what countries do I have to go through to get to Iran? And what is it going to be like when I get there? <laughs> yeah. What are some of the things you like you would look forward to doing the most once you got there? Eating, <laughs> <laughs> eating, oh boy. eating. I would say is probably the big one. There's Meeting so your much. family members, but that's more personal to me. As far as things I want to see, I really look forward to seeing Tehran the way you've described it, and I really want to go hiking in the Alvors Mountains. Oh yeah, the the Alvors Mountains are amazing and incredible to look at, but um. I am going to preface the rest of this episode by saying a lot of my experience in visiting Iran centers mostly in Tehran and the surrounding areas because that's where most of my family lives. So in the amount of time that I have there, it's far more important for me to go and visit family and see everyone than it is to go to like a lot of different places throughout Iran. So... If my family members find out I went to Iran and I didn't visit them, I'd be in trouble. So most of my experiences with museums and whatnot is things that are in Tehran, which is great that you're so interested in Tehran because I'm your pro, <laughs> kind of. You're the expert in the area. <laughs> in that I'll particular area. I'll defer to you and everything. Not everything, because <laughs> even then, even then, I don't get to do a lot of touristy stuff. Mom. <laughs> So, no, my experience is limited, uh, but I hope it will be useful, useful. And anyone who's out there that wants to know more, there's, like, so many people who have traveled to Iran and did these great video. That they've done these vlogs on YouTube that you can go and see, and they've got a lot of recommendations for what to do and what to experience. So I would take this as one small thing to to look at for your research and if you really want to go look at all these other experiences too because everyone experiences something different and besides those blogs uh there are actually several really good specials on like the travel channel about going to iran mm -hmm. uh one in particular from recent memory was when anthony bourdain uh filmed his oh, yeah. tv show there and showed all of the amazing <laughs> food that oh, you can gosh. eat over there i'm getting hungry just thinking about it oh goodness uh, we're gonna have to have a whole episode about food but let's get back to travel <laughs> back to travel so first things first Gotta get you packed. Let's talk about some of your essentials for going to Iran. First things first, we are in the age of technology. Everyone has, you know, some of y'all are gonna bring your video games or your, everyone's gonna bring their cell phone. Your Switch. <laughs> yeah, I was like, should I bring, I think last time I was like, do I wanna take my Nintendo yeah, Switch Yeah, I traveled to all the way to Iran so I could play Super Smash Brothers, right? <laughs> Well, with my cousins, it'll be pretty awesome. Come uh, on, man. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> but you are going to need a charge adapter because plugs in Iran are like European plugs. So they got that 220 voltage. You are going to need You're something. You're going to fry something if you plug it, an American outlet in, right? Yeah. So you really need to get, get yourself one of those. And really, that's just a good thing to have for when you travel to Europe as well. And um, 
Besides that, you also want to maybe take a water bottle with you. There are plenty of places in Iran where you can buy water, but it's just, it's easier, especially in the summertime, which is when I've traveled the most. If you want to stay hydrated, uh, you want to get yourself a water bottle. Hydration is important. Super important. Kids. <laughs> Uh, some of the choices in what you pack is also going to depend on what activities you plan to do. And I'm going to tell you the biggest question that I get from people who uh, are interested in going to Iran is, what do I wear? Because that's a hot topic. That's a big thing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's common knowledge that over there, there is a dress code law. It's strictly followed in public. And you'll definitely want to take some casual clothes to wear indoors. But here's what you'll want. For, to focus on your outdoor outfits. So for all the women out there, you will need to wear a scarf over your hair and some light coat that covers your arms that goes at least to mid-thigh. Um, I usually go in the summer, so I always try to get something with light material. I've even used a light cotton cardigan as my overcoat. Uh, just so we can be clear, when we say outdoor, we don't necessarily mean, you know, outdoors, more public spaces. Yeah, going right? out into public. Because mm -hmm. when you're inside, you can wear, you can whatever, wear whatever you, you want. want. Or as little as you want. You can wear as little as you want, whatever you want. It's, you know, I'm in a tank top and mini shorts and just running around. And honestly, in the Tehran summer heat, that's a godsend to be able to dress like that indoors. But you don't get to go out in a tank top and mini short shorts when you're outside. Can't do that. You will get in trouble. <laughs> Real quick, what about, are there public pools? Mm, yes, there are public pools. Or beaches? No be. Well, mm, I think there are beaches, but again, not in Tehran. <laughs> no. So I don't yeah, know not, what the rules are. Not in the there middle of the country. There are beaches, especially on the coast, and there's apparently an island too, but, you know, little old me never got to go. Maman. Maman. <laughs> it's her fault. All right. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> there, are, there are public pools. You can go there. They are sectioned off where the girls are in one pool and the boys are in another pool, so you can't intermingle. Uh, my mother never lets me go. Back to clothes, though. Women, you are going to have to wear a scarf. Uh, the lucky thing is that scarves are very popular uh, over here. Just to wear around your neck, you just take one of those and put it over your head. Uh, so again, women, you are going to have to wear that scarf over your hair. And you are going to have to wear a light coat. And this coat needs to cover your, most of your arms. And it needs to go down to at least mid-thigh. And I usually go in the summer, so I always try to get something with light material. It could be a light cotton cardigan or what have you. As long as it ties in the front somehow, you should be all right. You also need to wear pants. Can't wear shorts. And you might get fussed at if you try capris. And uh, men also cannot wear shorts outside. You guys also have to wear pants. Uh, really? Yeah. It's just showing skin is indecent. And oh, tank tops are not a thing either. You men can't wear tank tops. Darn. Yeah. You know how much I wear tank tops. Well, listen, man, <laughs> you, you giggle about that now, but summertime heat. Sun's out, gun's out. The other thing is everyone will benefit from having a good pair of walking shoes because you're going to do a lot of walking, whether you're walking around to go shopping or look at museums or walking through the parks. And also, if you go in the summer, do yourself a big favor and take bug spray with you because Persian mosquitoes don't play. Ooh. They don't. Uh, we stay at my grandmother's house whenever we go to Iran. And it's an old-fashioned house where, like... You sometimes have to, like, go to the outhouse that's ac across the yard. So if you have to get up in the middle of the night and to use the bathroom, by the time you go to the bathroom and then walk back, you've been bitten at least 12 times. <laughs> I bet. It's, it's bad. I don't think any of you are going to have to stay at my grandmother's villa, though, so you um, guys are fine. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're staying in Iran for a while and you're not backpacking, you can thank me for this. You want to take a fancy outfit for parties because there's a very high chance you're going to be invited to a mehmuni, to a party, and you're going to want to look your absolute best. And the most important thing to know when you're packing all of your clothing 
uh, is this. Iranians are very fashionable. When they go out in public, oh, yeah. they take particular care with their appearance, like even the men do. So if you go outside in pants with rips in them and you got a baggy t-shirt on, they're, they're going to know. They're going to know that you're not... That you're not Iranian. They're going to know you're foreign. Oh, <laughs> really? That's what will tip them off, huh? Yeah, it's not going to be anything like blonde hair, blue eyes. White skin. White skin. No, nah, it's going to be how you dress. No, for real, the though. You need speak to... Farsi. <laughs> the fact that you speak Farsi with an accent or just don't speak Farsi at all. <laughs> uh, the girls especially, oh my gosh, their fashion is fierce. They, you know, they pick out the, the, the overcoats that they wear and the scarves that they wear are like really, really nice looking and they do their makeup up real cute and everyone there really enjoys fashion. So I'm actually going to say there's an indoor mall that I frequent with my cousins called the Palladium and the first time we went there, we felt disheveled going in there. We're like, gosh, everyone here is so fancy. And so like the next time we went, I picked out my nice chador. I put on my my really nice scarf. I put makeup on. I don't normally put makeup on, but for this, for Palladium, I put makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, guys, just, just be very particular, you know, be careful about your uh, about your clothes. And don't forget your cane and top hat. And hold on. <laughs> Not that fancy. <laughs> Oh no, I have an image I of have, me with a cane and top hat walking, and walking down, down the streets in, of Tehran oh, in God. my, in my, uh, what do you call it? Coattails. Coattails. <laughs> oh no. Looking like Willy Wonka. Oh no. Don't do it to me. Don't do it to me, Seth. Please don't At do it. At least they'll think I'm fashion conscious. <laughs> All right. Now, as far as traveling is concerned. Oh, good. <laughs> You will usually take about mm, two to three planes to get to Iran. Uh, the international airport is located outside of Tehran. And there's other smaller airports in Iran, but this is the big international one. And I think there's one in Shiraz as well, which is further south. Now, my family in the U.S., we live in the south. So we usually make our way over overseas, starting from the Atlanta airport. Delta! Oh, Delta Airlines. <laughs> Delta Airlines, because life is a nightmare. <laughs> so from Atlanta, I've been through, through Chicago once, but so either Atlanta or Chicago, then you will either go to, you'll, you'll go to some European airport. It could be Amsterdam, it could be Frankfurt, it could be Rome. Uh, if I had to rank those, Amsterdam is the best. Amsterdam is the most comfortable one. They have these special tiny hotels you can stay at. And trust me, you're going to need it because the flight from the U.S. all the way to Tehran, if you include the layovers, can take almost 24 hours, sometimes over 24 hours. Ouch. All together. Is, uh, is that accounting for time difference? Uh, or is that total? That's just total. Sorry, the we'll the, cut the that time out. difference is kind of crazy, but no, I have timed it like not looking at the clock change, just setting my timer from the minute I left my house to drive to an airport in the U.S. to when I finally arrived at my final desti destination in, in Iran and I've stopped the timer. And so many times it's been at least 24, almost and sometimes over 24 hours. Mm. Um, I do not recommend Rome as an airport with layovers because there's no comfortable place to stay. I and I'm not going to get into it, but I don't like the Rome airport. Those Romans. <laughs> Those Romans don't know how to make a comfortable airport. But regardless of what airport you're in, no matter your international flight, you're going to want to make sure you have essentials and a change of clothes in your carry-on because those layovers are rough. You're going to want something that kind of helps you freshen up midway through your travel. Also, if something happens with your suitcases on the way over, you don't want to be left stranded somewhere without clothes. Have, have some spare clothes in your carry-on. Having something to do probably wouldn't hurt either. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't really want to watch TV the entire time I'm traveling. Yeah, TV is uh, can get hard on your eyes, especially when you've been on a plane for so long. I usually like, you know, taking an audiobook, downloading some of your favorite podcasts. <laughs> eh? There's only so many mobile games I can play. <laughs> yeah. Get a book, man. Sometimes the screens are too much. Bring, bring yourself a book. Now, 
let's get back to Iran, because by now you have landed in Iran. If you like hiking, oh my goodness, you are going to love the Alborz mountain range. There is like so much to do. Like, okay, okay, hold on, I, let me back up, because I'm getting excited. So Tochal is the mountain that is next to Tehran, and it's where I'm going to be basing a lot of my experiences from. There's a lot of sections that people go to just to enjoy the outdoors and be in the open air restaurants. You remember in our Noruz episode, we talked about uh, Siz de Bedar, where mm -hmm. people will go outside on a picnic. So many people will go to Tochal and have their picnics up on the mountains. Real They've... popular getaway, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You mentioned backpacking earlier. Um, I know if I go, I'll have to meet your family, of course, and spend some time in the city. But yeah. if I ever get the opportunity, I would kill to go backpacking in Iran or go hiking oh, yeah. up the Alborz Mountains. Uh, the images you've shown me from, from your trips abroad have are just breathtaking. And the natural world in Iran just seems so different from what I've seen in the in, in, in the southern United States that mm -hmm. uh, I think it'd be a really amazing uh, opportunity to get to camp out under a different set of stars mm -hmm. in a different hemisphere and enjoy that. It would, it's remarkable. And no matter, you know, every part of Iran has such different terrain and whatnot. It's beautiful. Just the rivers you can find and the mountains. It's, it's a beautiful place to go backpacking. You showed me that video you took of this, uh, I think it was in the mountains, wasn't it? It was a set of, uh, it was basically like a small festival or basically a small town that had restaurants suspended above a river. Oh, and... I know what you're talking about. That's These that beautiful band. trees. Yeah. That is that is a place I would kill to go to, too. And that is actually uh, another place that we can totally go when we go there. I have to tell you about that band. Uh, so basically, it's this part of the mountain where you can find a lot of restaurants set up, kind of like what you saw uh, in that video I showed you. And these restaurants can get really fancy. And like you saw, there are some that they have decks set up over a nearby river. So you can be on top of the floating water while you're eating or smoking hookah. And here's the really neat thing. I told you all these restaurants are on the side of the mountain, right? Some parts of it, the restaurants still have to have their goods delivered to them by donkeys because the path hasn't been modified to allow cars to get through that easily. Um, Aww. yeah, so you have to like, a lot of it is walking. If we go to dad band, we can only drive so much of the way before we have to walk the rest of it. And it's beautiful. Oh my gosh. I love it. Now I want to go to dad band. <laughs> oh, we have to put that on our list when we go. Now there are restaurant areas, but there's also some sections where you can do fun activities. Like you can go do paintball. You can do VR games. Uh, I even saw an escape room set up the last time that I went. They actually had an escape room. Oh, really? Yeah. So the base of the mountain really feels like a fair sometimes. And if you want to scale the mountain, you you do need to make sure you have the gear for it. But if you want to just hang out at the foot of the mountain, they have so many activities to do. Yeah. Uh, climbing requires things like climbing rope, pitons for spiking into the mountain. Yeah. Or, you know, actual muscle, you know, stuff like that. Actual muscle. They have all these paths that you can use to go all the way up to the top of the mountain. So you never actually have to scale sharp sides of the mountain or, everything oh, or anything. Oh, okay. They have legit paths. But you have to have muscle. You better train. <laughs> you better be ready for it. Now, you could also be like me and my family. We just take the cable cars all the way up to the top. And then if you want to get to the peak of Tochal, you walk for about 30 minutes. And 30 minutes at an elevated level <laughs> with That's very a, little oxygen yeah. is tasking. Elevation is rough. It's uh, especially when you don't exercise as much as you ought to. <laughs> And if you do want to do that, the peak of Tochal is about 3,900 meters. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's higher than I've ever been. <laughs> and here's uh, the really At least really hiking, thing. at least. Do you remember in the Shahnameh where I told you that uh, Damavand is that famous mountain? Mm -hmm. From the peak of Tochal, I can see Damavand. Oh, cool. The last time we went there, I was like, hey, Kaveh. I like, turned to my brother. like, hey, Kaveh. Hey, your enemy, the hawk is in there. You help put him down. Thanks, buddy. And he gave me a look like, God, you dork. 
<laughs> that was just me being a Shahnameh nerd on the peak of Tochal. But you can't see Dama then, and you're, you can yell at Zahak from there. You are precious. <laughs> Hush. <laughs> I had my fun. Now, I don't know if this is a thing in Tochal, but there are a lot of parts of the mountains in Iran that you can even explore the caves in some of them. Oh. There was, we were out, I don't remember because it was such a long time ago, but I know we were outside of Tehran, and we did go to this part of the mountain where we had to put on gear to actually go inside and explore inside the caves. And listen, guys, they go deep. And they can get really dangerous, so do not take your adventurous mother with you or she will hop over an infinite chasm using just an 8 inch wide board and scare the bejesus out of you and you will have flashbacks to that moment thinking this is how I lose my mother. She's just going to go down into the chasm. Okay, I need to breathe. Don't take your mother into the caves, oh my goodness. But it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm sure. <laughs> Mother is excluded. <laughs> Mother is excluded. All right. <laughs> we need to move away from the caves. We love you, Mama. Love you, Mama. Please don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> oh, as far as getting around and staying in Iran, here are some really quick tips. Uh, the streets do have English translations, and there are some restaurants that have English on their menus. And it's improved over the years, but it can still be a bit challenging to be an English speaker in Iran. Um, the tourist areas of Iran are well equipped to help everybody who's like has a different language other than Farsi. But uh, if you don't, you're going to have to stick it out and do your best and maybe practice a few basic Farsi lines before you go over there. This might be a better episode for the food uh, episode we plan to do, but... I really want to talk about uh, American food in Iran. We are going to have specifically the Iranian pizza. Ooh, don't talk to me about the Iranian pizza. Ooh. Why don't you tell me what was on that pizza? No, so. we're, we're going to save that for another time. You torture <laughs> me enough as it is. All right. Other quick things to know. There is Wi-Fi in Iran, but if you want a working cell phone, you are going to have to purchase a SIM card there and use it in your phone. Most hotels and social places like restaurants are going to have Wi-Fi. You just have to ask them about it. Um, I do know that I stayed in a hotel in Esfahan once, and we had to pay for the internet. And we kind of just chose to go without for that one little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, other things to know that you Americans wouldn't know about. Ooh, toilets! Okay, guys. That's a different situation there. I'm sure you guys know about the toilet that you just kind of sit on and do your business, but there are squat toilets in Iran. And uh, in a lot of public places, they don't have the Western toilets that y'all are used to. They will just have squat toilets. It's a big hole in the ground on it a tile floor. Pretty much is a tile floor, hole in the ground. The really nice places will have a hose that you can turn on and wash yourself with. Um, I do need to let you know about the toilet paper situation in Iran, at least currently as far as this episode is concerned. Iranian toilet paper is not uh, meant to disintegrate. It cannot disintegrate in the toilet. So a lot of people will just kind of wash themselves down with the hose, pat themselves dry with the toilet paper, and then throw the toilet paper away in a garbage can. Uh, sanctions, I mean, man. Sanctions. So, so we're clear. You're, you're clean before that ever touches you. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, You've that, ideally that's, washed that's the yourself That's etiquette clean. way of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, fun fact about the toilets. Uh, you know it's technically uh, a Muslim country, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in Islam, it's considered rude to have a toilet facing towards Mecca. So a lot of these toilets are designed where you're facing away from Mecca when you do uh, your business. Oh my God. And some of the some of the architecture and the ways they have to move around things make some of the toilets so awkward in the bathrooms that they're in. Because they're like, <laughs> it just has to face this way. Some angular toilet design. It can't face any other way. <laughs> oh my God, it's hilarious. So, we've got you settled. You are here. Let's get you exploring Iran when it's not the mountains. Now again, specifically, we'll focus on Tehran. The best way to travel around Tehran is by taxi, but there are also bus stops and trains. Uh, you can always call a taxi. They, you, they will have the taxi numbers available to you. You can call a taxi and tell them where you want to go. 
the bus stops as well. You tell them where you want to go and they will let you know, oh yes, I'm going in that direction or no, I'm not going in that direction. And the trains, thankfully, the trains do have English on them. So you will at least know where to stop if you go by train. Oh, good. Um, I was wondering, uh, if I do go to Iran, can I use services like Uber or Lyft? They do have special uh, apps for that. You will need to, of course, have a SIM card. You'll need to download the apps. But they do have those kinds of services, services. ride shares. Yeah. Okay. So that'll be very helpful. You'll probably need to get a local Iranian to help you get those set up for you if you don't know one personally. <laughs> now, here's another fun thing. If you want to travel down to Esfahan or Shiraz, they have these really fancy travel buses that will take you down there. You can also go by train. But when I went down to Esfahan by the bus, it was really fancy. I was sitting in this comfortable chair. They brought me this little tray full of like all these goodies and sweets and snacks to eat on the way down they were playing a funny movie up on the screen it's like harry potter except with a movie <laughs> except and the bus is well, oh train, gosh it wasn't that i was nice. about to say that the bus doesn't drive as crazy but uh <laughs> Ooh. you guys we might need to stop and talk about this now that we're talking about transportation uh, don't don't expect anybody to respect like your your normal idea of traffic laws. Basically, it's the wild west out there. When people ask me, "Oh, Sarah, are you ever scared when you go to Iran? Do you ever fear for your life?" and I tell them, "Yes, every time I get into a car, specifically my grandfather's car. God bless him, God rest his soul. But oh my God, the man scared me. Now let me back this up and tell you a little bit about this." So here is what I can tell you about the traffic rules in Iran and really all of Western Asia from what I've heard. To put it simply, there are no rules. Listen to me. Look me in the eye, Seth. There are no speed limits. There are no lanes. There are no, I think I've only seen two traffic lights. It is wild over there. And just you, the, the, how close you get to another car as you're driving and wow, how bad did it have to get for them to put those up to make those traffic lights up uh well here's the other thing there are lanes in the road there are signs but you know that one line in pirates of the caribbean where they're talking about according to the code is like oh the code is more maybe, like guidelines maybe less rules and more like guidelines exactly Yarg. and that's what traffic rules are like in iran no one follows them for god's sake there's no seat belt rule it's just mm. okay no no no. there is a seat seat belt rule now if you're in the front of the car you need a seat belt <laughs> if you're in the back you're fine don't even worry about it <laughs> Uh, you don't need a car seat for your kid. Just hold on to that little sucker. I have also seen entire families of eight uh, piled onto one motorcycle. Woo! I have seen a father at the front, his little child sitting in front of him. There's a kid between, there's a kid, maybe two kids between him and mama. Mama's got a baby in her arms and there's a kid hanging off the back. And sometimes, sometimes mama's got everybody's groceries of the day balanced on her head. As they're just wow. weaving around. It's just, it gets crazy. <laughs> the things that you see. All right. Now, that's getting into a car. Now let's talk about crossing the street. You know, as a pedestrian. <laughs> that's a whole new ball game. You basically have to chase, take a chance and walk across and hope they're not a jerk that will run into you. It's kill or be killed. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> It is so wild out there. Now, what I have learned to do, and I'm going to pass this tidbit on to you guys, is you're not the only one who's going to be trying to cross the street. Watch for other people and just walk with them. <laughs> That's what you do. Or you just let your cousin, who, who ain't afraid of nothing, to do it for you. Thank you. That's all. Now, once you've gotten over your fear of the driving and how people move around. And the toilets. And and are you going to be scared of those squat toilets? Might be a little scared of the squat toilets. Is it, is it the balance? It's the balancing act. You do have to balance. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll, get, I have, I guess I I'll be a pro by the end of it. I mean, you, dude, your squats are going to be like so good <laughs> by the end of it. <laughs> Just practice your squats, everybody. You'll be fine. <laughs> so. Let's get to exploring to Iran a little bit more, guys. Let's go to the local bazaars. Now, the one I go to the most is Tadrish. 
It's full of food and clothes and there's all sorts of items that you can buy and it's also a good place to hang out. So like my cousins and I have a favorite coffee shop that we like to go to that's really close to Tadrish. And my brother Kaveh has his favorite tea shop that is also located in Tadrish. Um, I am gonna say that we went to his tea shop and we were hanging out with him and uh, I asked for the Wi-Fi for that restaurant. And that's how I found out that Tadrish has two Pokestops there. Oh, wow. So for you Pokemon Go fans, you can play Pokemon Go uh, in Iran. I will also say that the last time my beautiful wife went to Tehran, she brought me back a Cyndaquil. I did. That was both lucky and had perfect IVs. <laughs> for um, all the people who don't play Pokemon Go, that was a really, that was really, a really good... That really prime thing that I got. Yeah. And uh, that, that ends the geek moment for now. <laughs> Now, while we're here in Tadrish, I, won't, I do want to share a story that I have about the smoothie shop that's there. Uh, we go to the smoothie shop because it's, it's a hot day. I need a cold drink. And behind the counter are all these decorative mugs. And among them, there was a mug from my rival college in the U.S. Yes. I, oh, <laughs> I was furious. We should say Sarah and I's rival school. It, yes, because it is our college. Uh, but the rival college's mug was there. I was furious. I felt personally attacked. Like, here's the mascot of that rival in the heart of the marketplace of my ancestors. Like, the how jerks dare. get to be here, but I don't. <laughs> we have to fix this. And I, I went to my mom and I made such a fuss about it that my mom helped me get a mug from our own college. And the last summer that we went, we specifically went to find that store to give the, the mug to the owner and be like, you put it right next to that mug. Just give me some peace of mind. <laughs> uh, but it did turn out that the shop went out of business and closed. So we weren't able to give him the mug. We kind of just went all the way to Serves Tadrish. him right. <laughs> probably, they probably be closed because they were cursed <laughs> by their inappropriate school selection. <laughs> They tampered with the dark magics known as college football. <laughs> it's very important you choose the right college team. <laughs> right. Otherwise, you'll be cursed, of course. <laughs> oh, man. Now, as far as souvenirs are concerned that are not college footballs, <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple of stores in Tadrish where you can get souvenir-like items, but there's a really good place in Tehran called Vila, You'll have to take a taxi to get there, but, like, there's a whole street where, like, all the stores have all these beautiful, like, hand-painted boxes and all these beautiful... They have Minahari sort of design vases and stuff. Minahari is, like, the miniature painting. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to get any of those really nice, pretty items that are really good for, like, gifts to home, you'll want to travel over to Vila. Now, as you're traveling... And going through the bazaars and stuff, you are going to occasionally see some street performers. A lot of them are going to play music or sing, but you'll also see fortune tellers and people carrying Esfan. And all, to, for all these people, you know, it's, it's common courtesy. You can give them money. It's not considered inappropriate. Uh, but let me tell you about the fortune tellers because this is really cute. So the fortune tellers have a box of folded up cards that have pieces of poetry on them. The poetry is specifically from a poet named Hafez. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I've told you about Hafez before, right, Seth? Right. He is an old Persian poet who, his poetry is actually sort of treated like a divination of sorts. So at, at parties and special occasions, people will hold the book of Hafez, they will ask a question, they will turn to a random page, they'll read that poem, and that poem is supposed to sort of be the answer to whatever question you had. Kind of a form of bibliomancy. <laughs> That's me breaking out a fancy word today. Tell us what bibliomancy means. It comes from Greek words meaning book and uh -huh. uh, divination. That's what mancy means, uh -huh. uh, which I didn't know until a while ago. Uh, but I can explain more on that some other time. Okay, we'll explain more. Yeah, because I want to get back to these fortune tellers on the streets, because they're not walking around with a book. They're carrying a box of cards, and each card has Hafez poetry on there. They have these little birds. The birds are have been trained to pick out a fortune and give 
out of the box and give it to you. And then that's your cute little fortune that was given to you by a bird. Are the birds trained at the bird temple? Oh my god! Let it go, Seth. Let the bird temple go. There's no bird temple, okay? The birds, Sarah. No, the no. This is the bird, birds. The birds are trained. Fate. The birds are trained by the person holding the box. Or are, is the person holding the box it. trained by the birds? Oh Lord, it's whoever you give the money to for getting that fortune. <laughs> Sometimes you'll also pe see people carrying around kind of this bowl of burning embers, and it's what they're burning is as fand. Or it's a plant known as rue. No, not the little girl from from the, from the Hunger, Hunger Games. Games. No, <laughs> um, well, Persians believe that burning rue will keep away the evil eye and misfortune. So it's used in a lot of ceremonies and important occasions. Uh, but sometimes people will burn it just in case, you know, to kind of keep misfortune away from you. A little good luck. Yeah. Uh, so you can ask the person who's carrying this bowl of esfan. Um, to to wave the fumes around you and say the chant, and then you you kind of tip them for doing that for mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, I, actually, before we uh, started this episode, I I did a little research on Esfand and Rue, and if, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Rue is like it actually grows in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's an herb that people use for decorating their gardens. It's got these uh, little kind of uh, spiny leaves and these beautiful little yellow flowers that grow <laughs> out of it. Uh, it's an herb, but it's actually, you, you don't want to use it for food. Uh, the Romans back in ancient Rome used to use it to uh, treat snake bites. Ooh. You were supposed to eat it along with uh, another plant that kind of got mixed in. Uh -huh. But the ironic thing is... Uh, Rue is highly poisonous when consumed. Ooh. And it will lead to a very agonizing death. Oh, okay. So, yeah, don't eat it. Burn don't it. Don't eat it. Burn it. <laughs> Burning it, good for you. Eating it, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't eat it. Uh, now, I am talking about people you're going to see on the streets. And we've talked about the cute stuff. We've talked about the people who sing and play instruments and give you little fortunes and burn S fan for you. But another unfortunate thing you're going to see in Tehran, and really any major cities that you go to visit, you are going to see uh, street beggars. And in Iran, they can get pretty dis persistent, and it is heartbreaking to see them. Uh, but I just want to let you guys know, when you go into a big city, you're going to see them. Uh, the last thing I want people to be aware of is also pickpockets. Another thing that whenever you're visiting any big city, you need to be aware of pickpocketers, no matter where you go in the world. Um, as long as you're aware of your surroundings, you should be okay, though. My brother did get pickpocketed once. He was holding my iPod. Oh. <laughs> yes, it was the early 2000s. He, he, he got hit, my iPod swiped out of his pocket. Made me mad. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I want to move on to a couple of small questions that my friends asked me about Iran. Uh, they had a lot of questions about money. Uh, like, can your credit cards work? All that good stuff. So you cannot use your credit cards in Iran. That just doesn't work. You are going to want to take cash with you. Mm -hmm. And the currency, if you want to get money exchange, there are money exchange shops. They'll change it for you. They have one in the airport. Uh, but you can also find money exchange sites in Iran. You can also get it changed before you go. And just so everybody knows, uh, Iran uh, uses a currency called the rial, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, but most people will not call it that. They call it Tuman. Yes, that is exactly it. I'm glad you remember these things. <laughs> you do listen to me from time to time. <laughs> and then I was also asked the question about how tip is seen in Iran. Tips are totally okay. You can absolutely tip people. You should tip. I you, guess. you should tip. It's you, you have to remember that this is a very generous society, and you also want to be seen as generous. So tip everybody. Tip your taxi drivers. Tip your doormen. Tip your restaurant people. You know. Mm -hmm. Tip 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 tip. Now let's talk about some other fun places that you can visit in Tehran, which is kind of the things that as a tourist you're going to want to go and visit. So. The biggest thing that people see in Tehran nowadays is the Milad Tower. 
which is this really, really, really tall tower that has kind of this bulb at the end, at the very top. It is 435 meters tall and it's basically the International Trade and Convention Center. And this tower has so many things. It's got restaurants, it's got convention areas. The top floor is a revolving restaurant, like it turns. Oh, like as... the Space Needle. Yeah. Uh, they've got observation decks. There's a five-star hotel in there. And I do also want to say this is the sixth tallest tower in the world. Uh, for reference, uh, 435 meters is uh, al almost four and a half football fields. <laughs> so if you want to go up four and a half football fields, go to the Milad Tower. I've never been. I've always wanted to. But again, Maman doesn't take me to go do touristy things. <laughs> Another place you're going to want to go visit is the Valia Asr Street. Uh, it has a whole lot of trees. It is one of the main commercial centers in Tehran. And it actually leads to Tadrish. Like, I have to walk down Valia Asr Street in order to get to Tadrish. It is the longest street in the Middle East. Uh, and if you walk along it, you don't just find Tajrish. You also see uh, they've got a Tehran City Theater. They've got a cinema museum. Uh, they have this really famous park called Parque Melat uh, that you can go and see. And if you just walk up and down the street, you find some of the best shops and stores to go and visit as well. So it's a very famous street, but also it just has all these beautiful trees that kind of lean over and, and provide a lot of shade in some parts of it. It's, hmm. it's a very beautiful street. Um, now there's a lot of museums that you can visit as well. You can go and see the Royal Jewels that are located in the Treasury of National Jewels in the Central Bank in Iran. And they're shiny and they're pretty. There's like crowns and brooches. When you and... say the Royal Jewels, you're talking about from the last Shah of Iran? Yeah, these are, these are kind of the jewels that were kind of inherited and passed down. Some of them are gifts from other countries. There's this beautiful peacock throne that is displayed there as well. It's this old Persian throne that is just absolutely beautiful and stunning. Guys, Google the peacock throne. You could go and see this in person if you go to this, uh, to see the royal jewels. Hmm. You can go there. Uh, other museums that I know of, there is a clock museum where they basically took this old house and they changed it into a museum where they have all these timepieces set up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's really neat to look at. And the garden and the house itself is really beautiful. There's also the Golestan Palace. That's a huge one. They have a lot of old artifacts and they have some rooms where it's all just mirrors everywhere. It's glittery and beautiful. The Golestan Palace is a must-see. Hmm. Now, I looked up to see what other museums are on there. There's a whole, there are so many museums. There is, uh, there's an artist that I really like that's very famous, Mahmoud Farshian. Oh, yeah. He has a museum there. And when I found out, I called my mom and said, Mom, why have you not taken me to see this? We have a lot of his prints hanging around our home. We do. Uh, we'll post some examples on our Twitter for anybody who's interested. Oh, we should. We we should do just a line of like our favorite Farshian pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also, <laughs> there's a Persian cats museum too. Oh. I know. <laughs> now I know what you want to go see. <laughs> I want to go see the cats. Let's go see the kids. I don't know if there's actual cats in the museum. I just saw a Persian cat museum. I don't know what that entails. <laughs> if it's cats, we have to go. <laughs> Now, besides museums, there are so many parks. Guys, if there's one thing you need to know about Iran, they love nature. Even in the cities, they are going to have big spaces where you've got all these trees and open areas. And you can walk to any old park and love it. But, like, there's big parks that you can go to. There's Park in Melat that I mentioned earlier. There's actually this new um, area, this new design bridge called Pola Tabiat, the yeah. Tabiat Bridge. You showed me that. Oh, my gosh. It is an Instagram crazy place. <laughs> but when I went there, there were so many people taking Instagram photos. It was ridiculous. And then at night, it lights up. But it basically is a bridge between two really big parks. Mm. Uh, and the bridge itself has restaurants on it and stuff. It's <laughs> crazy. It's, it's beautiful. But guys, any park that you go to is going to be beautiful. 
Uh, you mentioned this earlier that you want to go and see the Azadi Square and the tower that's there, right? Yeah, there's this really big statue of Kaveh there that I want to go see. We need to make Kaveh actually stand by that statue so we can take a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you use that picture in our YouTube thumbnail? I did. It was the thumbnail for our most recent episode. Yeah. For uh, the end of Zahak's reign. I think I got upset because we <laughs> couldn't put Blacksmith in the title, so <laughs> so you put the thumbnail up for yeah. me at least. Or for my brother. <laughs> a couple of other tips before we finish off here, guys, because uh, I think we we just about wrapped up your basic tips for traveling to Iran. Um, store prices and haggling. That's a big thing. There is a lot of haggling done in Iran. Uh, it's happened less and less as it used to. People will still haggle, but usually the set price is the price. Uh, but this is where I want to come in and talk about scams. Uh, my, I have a friend who she traveled to Eastern Asia and she learned about a couple of scams that she had to watch out for as a, as a traveler there. So she asked me, Hey, are there any scams? Thank you, Lara. Uh, and the, the answer to that is there aren't really scams in Iran. However, if they see that you're foreign, they are going to raise the prices on some of their items and stuff a little bit. Cause, Cause they assume you have money. They assume you have money and I don't know if you guys know about the situation in Iran, but economically, people are in dire streets over there. <laughs> but um, yeah, they will they will haggle and they'll barter. Um, so if you want to haggle, go for it. Try it. If you don't feel like it, you know, just be aware that as a foreigner, they won't do this all the time. But there will be occasions where they where they will raise the price for you. Um, there is something else I do want to talk about. Uh, I had, we, I've actually made a new friend. Mm -hmm. This is where I want to plug her in. Uh, she is from Las Plumas de Simorg. Uh, her name is Lara as well. Different from the Lara I was talking about earlier. This is two <laughs> Laras. This is the Simorg Lara, as we've been calling her. Uh, she has been studying, uh, actually, Iranian history and Zoroastrian history. And she has her own channel. You can follow her on Twitter at Las Plumas de Simorg. Uh, she is amazing. And she's actually gone to Iran. And I asked her, you know, as a foreigner, what were some of the things that kind of threw you off or kind of weirded you out or that, you know, that concerned you when you were in Iran? And she said that people were really, really friendly to the point that she was worried that they were scamming her or that things were going to turn sour in some way. But it was just people being genuinely nice. And this is where I want to bring up that tat off. We've talked about tat off in the past, but tat off is so part of the culture. Being as generous as possible is just kind of a way of life over there. If you, as a foreigner, go over to Iran, people are going to be so excited to see you. You are going to get invited to people's houses. You'll be invited to stay in, at people's homes for the night. People will look out for you. This friend, Lara, that I talked to who went to Iran, mm -hmm. the taxi driver stopped to help put her SIM card into her phone because she was having a hard time doing it. He didn't ask for anything. He just saw that she was in trouble and wanted to help. And oh. genuinely, this is one of the most generous places that you can go and see. That lines up with a lot of Iranians in the U.S. too. I, I have never met an unfriendly Iranian person. And part of that is Tarov. Listen, I've complained about Tarov in past episodes because it, sometimes it will get ridiculous. But at the heart of it, it is... The more generous you are, you know, the more good deeds you put out into the world, the better things are. And people are, it comes from a genuine place. People do truly want to help you out. And they will get really excited when they find out you're from another country. They will ask you what you like in Iran. They'll want to take you to get good food. They're going to want to take you to see their family. They're going to want to, like, make sure you have a good time because they're just so happy that people are there and they want to make sure you have a good time. Uh, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> and if you forgot what Tadoff is, I will recommend you go back and listen to the first episode before you do any traveling. Make sure you go back and get the details on Tadoff. <laughs> Understand people will think it's rude if you just accept right away. Yeah. Uh, you know, say no to things three times before accepting. Uh, and I'm going to conclude with our talk about traveling to Iran with this. Um, there are hotels that you can stay at that are specifically for tourists. Do your research. 
And uh, there's been a lot of people who says, should I go to Iran if I don't even know someone who's there? And I say, yes, guys, go. They have, you know, they have things set up for you. I told you these people are so friendly. You're going to get uncomfortable. You're going to feel a little lost as you do when you go to any foreign country where you don't know the language. But I promise you that these people are going to look out for you. You're going to have the best time. You're going to have so many wonderful experiences. And, you know, do your research. You're going to find so many people who have gone there and had such a good time. And I would just be so excited for more people to see that part of the world. Well, that was that was really nice to hear about. Um, but I think now it's time to move on to some of our fan questions, don't you? Yeah, let's do this. So first we were asked, uh, what is the deal with the cypress tree? Why is it brought up so much in Persian literature and poetry and mythology? Oh, like, yeah. what's the big deal about the cypress tree? Because we mentioned that in the one of our earlier Shahnameh episodes, It was in right? the first part of the Zahak special. Yeah. So cypresses are considered heavenly trees. So let's talk about the design of a tree. First of all, they are evergreens, mm -hmm. so they never you know, dry out their leaves and lose their leaves. They So that automatically makes them seem like they're never dying. They are immortal trees. They always have this, you know, strong, vibrant green color. And then the other thing, if you look at a cypress tree, all the branches kind of grow upwards. It's like they're all pointing towards heaven. They're reaching towards heaven. So this makes them to be considered heavenly trees. They are also some of the oldest trees in Iran. I mm. I believe, I could be wrong about this, but I think the oldest cypress tree in the world is located in Iran. So with having a cypress tree like this, if you describe someone as being like a cypress tree, if you compare someone to a cypress tree in Persian literature, that's kind of saying that they're he they're blessed by heaven or they're ethereal or there's just something otherworldly about them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, Zahak saw Fede Dune in a dream, and he was as tall as a cypress, which kind of made the implication of he has the blessings of Ahura Mazda. He's strong. He is he sent is by full heaven. Of holy power. Yeah. He is heaven's right hand man or something like that. <laughs> um, some other folks asked Is there any Zoroastrian architecture left in Iran? And if so, are they being used? Oh, uh, yeah. So I will say there's not as much as there used to be. There's places like Yazd, which is a town, which is a city in Iran. And there's other places that they will treat uh, Zoroastrian temples and buildings like historical tourist places. But there's a lot of instances where a lot of the old relics are being destroyed and taken down. So, you know conservation efforts can't be everywhere at once. The people who want to conserve all this, they couldn't be in all the places where there was Zoroastrian buildings. Mm -hmm. We saw an old area in Esfahan where the taxi driver told us it used to be where Zoroastrians lived, uh, but during some of the government upheavals of the past, some important sites were destroyed. Uh, if it was purposefully or otherwise, is up in the air. But like, there has been kind of this attempt, especially with the recent government, to diminish... Persian past, and that does include Zoroastrian sites. So mm -hmm. the ones that are still around are being uh, heavily protected as much as they can. That's good. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned Yazd. Uh, I should mention we used a, a good photograph of the fire temple in Yazd, which is a very important Zoroastrian site for the thumbnail of our video yeah. uh, about Zoroastrianism. I remember that now, for, yeah. For those interested in seeing it, we'll put it up on our Twitter, so you can look at that too. And uh, Lara from Las Plumas de Simorg, she went to Yazd as well, and she had a lot to say on it. She, was, she loved going there. It's another fantastic place that I would love to go. Mama, Mama. not fan berim, <laughs> berim diga. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think. I think those were the only two questions we had. Uh, guys, keep your questions coming. Yeah, I'm enjoying keep coming. this. We like this stuff. Yeah, but Seth, it's your time now. Roll for wisdom. What have you learned? Okay, so um, I was listening through some of our earlier episodes, and I found uh, myself uh, mentioning the idea of Persian fairies. Oh, yeah. 
And I found out that Persia, Persian mythology does kind of have its own version of theory, uh, of fairies called Peris. And no, I'm not making that name up. They are called Peris. Okay, no, actually, now that you say that, I feel dumb. I have a friend named Patty Saw, and Patty, her name means fairy like. Patty is the word for fairy. Hmm. And oh my God, why didn't I make that connection? Yeah. So anyway, uh, peris are these kind of uh, impish, uh, mischievous, uh, evil spirits in kind of earlier Persian mythology. They're evil. They are evil, yes. What? They are considered kind of like the lowest of the low in Ahriman's demon armies. Well, that's weird because They're... the fairies were helping in that one army. <laughs> They're responsible for th everything from like a bad harvest for the year to mm -hmm. like sickness to even being so mean as to pull a uh, a coffee table out so your foot hits it while you're walking by <laughs> uh, it's they, that parry again these are like the lowest level spirits that you're supposed to be able be getting rid of before Nauru's by cleaning your house and burning oh, Esfand, you know okay these are these are malevolent spirits you're supposed to repel <laughs> The, the weird thing is, uh, later on, they got kind of a, a glow up. Uh, <laughs> I guess they were more concerned with the, their public image because now Perry's are kind of more angelic in nature. Mm -hmm. they, they arrive uh, to people in kind of the guise of these beautiful people with wings okay. you know kind of like our standard so image grown of a fairy. people or small people both actually okay. a little mixture of both cool. um, it's kind of like a mixture between our 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 modern conception of the fairy like a tinkerbell yeah uh, while also kind of being a little more angelic okay. you know um, so i'm gonna guess those were the kinds of peris that were helping fight against Ahriman. Probably something like that. <laughs> um, it's really hard to tell because the word parry is used to kind of cover both of them. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, maybe they're both. Maybe they just are neutral beings that sometimes they're awesome and sometimes they're not. Kind of like fairies in D&D, &D, you know, they uh, they come in two flavors. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of these uh, good-natured... Uh, you know, mischievous uh, do-gooders, mm -hmm. or, or they come in like the most horrifying thing you can think of. That's really interesting. Uh, but besides that, I should mention, you remember Solrush from uh, several of our episodes <laughs> about the Shaname now. Solrush! <laughs> um, I found a source that states that he takes the form of a parry when talking to mortals, which kind of reinforces the whole angel thing. Yeah, I mean, if they come as like beautiful winged beings and he's an angel, yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. With that, I think we'll conclude our episode for today. Next time, we will go back to the Shaname to hear a, another story. Mm -hmm. We are actually going to continue Feridun's story. We're going to find out oh. what he does now that he has taken back the throne and brought Persia back to a time of peace. What's next for our young, glowing Our boy? intrepid hero. <laughs> and his two wives our who Luke have been Skywalker. finally freed from a very awful ordeal Curse they've been through. For a thousand years. At least a thousand years, yeah. <laughs> Want to keep up with us? You can follow us on Twitter, at Mazandercast. That's M-A-Z-A-N-D-E-R-C-A-S-T. We will announce the next episode through our Twitter, so spread the word. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions on current and future episodes. If there's any topics you'd like us to cover or stories you want to share with us, then email us at Mazandercast at gmail.com. Same spelling as our Twitter handle. Special thanks to Dr. Lynn for our cover art. Check out more of her work at LorraineLynn.com. That's L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E-L-I-N.com. We thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope you'll stick around for more in the future. As always, we hope you'll have good thoughts. Good words. And good deeds. Hold up, Hold up, up